I want to use uh, this verse today that I'm a, that we're going to study on, using it as an example on how we should study the Bible. You know, there's some people, and I've heard this, so I can say this, say that uh, they only read the red letters because that's what Jesus said, and the other w words in the Bible, print printed in black, uh, is what man says. Well, I have to correct them on that because if you go to Second Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All scripture. So when we read the Bible, we shouldn't look at the red letters as being the only important part of the Bible. Because it isn't. All scripture, the whole Bible, is written by God. Man wrote it physically but it says they were inspired by God on what to write so this is not just man's ideal uh, on what they put in the Bible and the only good part is the red part the red letters so read all the scriptures all the scriptures because they are from the Lord and when you read the Bible is you don't read it like a book a lot of people read books and and they read through a book pretty quick. Some some people read very fast and they like to read books. But they just read through it. We don't read the Bible that way. I've had people tell me, oh, I've already read the Bible. Yeah, well, you can read the Bible. And if you're a good reader and a fast reader, you can read the Bible pretty quick. But you didn't study it. You didn't get anything out of it. You have to study the Word of God. When you're reading the Scriptures, read the verse slowly. There's no speed reading in, in, uh, in reading the Bible. Read it slowly. Get what the Lord is trying to show you from the scriptures. You always pray before you read and ask the Lord to open your eyes to what he wants you to know. Because the Lord doesn't reveal everything to us at one time because we couldn't handle it. So we can read a, a chapter and we could read it three, four, five times. And not get anything, but then on the sixth time, uh, our eyes are open. We say, we reread it and we're like, oh man. And we catch what it said. So, when you read the Bible, you read it several times. And you read it slowly. It's not a book to be read like your other books. Your story books. So, reading the Bible is something you have to take time at. Make time and study it. It's not a book to read. It's a book to study. And we're going to we're going to start off with Hebrews 4:12. I'm just going to read one verse. And I'm going to show you how much is in one verse when you study the Bible. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerned of the thoughts and intents of the heart there's a lot said here and I think people read this verse and just bypass it and don't really know or understand what it says so what I'm going to do is break it down. This one little verse and see how much is in it. For the word of God is quick. The word quick. The word quick means alive. It's alive. The word is alive. It's not just words. It's real. It's alive. In Jeremiah 15, 16, it says... Thy words were found, and I did eat them, meaning he accepted them. And thy words was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. The word was a joy and rejoicing of his heart. So when we read or hear the word of God, we should have a joy and a rejoicing that we're hearing from our Father. 
our Father is speaking to us. He is speaking words that are alive. Not just some ink written in a book. In Proverbs 12, verse 25, Heaviness in the heart of a man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. If your heart is heavy, if there's something that's really heavy, heavy on your heart, and it's making you down. Right here it says a good word. A good word from God. Will make it glad. He will bring you from the heaviness of heart. Being burdened. And make you glad. The word can do that. The word of God can do that. We ought to expect. When we're down. When something's really heavy on us. We ought to expect. Okay, I'm going to get into the Word and God's going to lift me up. We ought to expect that. Because right here in, in Proverbs, He says that. If your heart is heavy, read the Word. It'll make you glad. Do we believe that? Do we believe this? This is God's words. We ought to believe it. And we ought to expect it. So next time you have a heavy heart, and you want to get out of that, read the Word of God. If something's got you so burdened down, go to the Word. The Word will always lift you up. God is there for us. That is, that is why He is there. He is our Father. And we, when we are down, we need to reach out our hand to Him and say, Father, help me. And the way we do that is going to His Word. So he can speak to us. In First Thessalonians five nineteen, he says, "Quench not the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. When the spirit of God that is in you, as a born again believer, the spirit of God is in you, and when that spirit receives the words of God, there's a rejoicing. What we read further up." There's a gladness. There's an excitement. We should be excited when we hear God's Word. We ought to not just sit there like we're hearing a story from a storyteller. And it's a shame to say that some churches you go to, that's what you get is stories from a storyteller. And of course, no, you're not going to get excited. But if you're hearing the Word of God, the Spirit in you wants to get excited, wants to rejoice. And right here it says, don't quench it. If you want to get excited over the Word of God, do it. Don't be ashamed not to. Do not quench the Spirit. Don't be embarrassed that someone around you is going to be looking at you or whatever. Don't worry about them. You're not there to please them. You're we're here to please God. And if His words make us excited, and we want to say, Amen, glory to God, or whatever it may be, then say it. Don't hold it. In Ephesians 4.30 it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy... We can grieve the Holy Spirit of God by holding back. If we get that excitement in us which is from the Holy Spirit and we hold it back then we're grieving the Holy Spirit from from bringing the inside excitement to the outside now there's different there's different kinds of excitement I mean people get real excited and they show it and you can see it but then there's some people who the way they are they get excited but you just can't see it that much but at least, at least they'll get a smile on their face. At least. Some people might holler. Some might just have a smile. But whatever it is the Holy Spirit leads you to do, you do it. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. See, we have something the natural man doesn't have. 
we have the Holy Spirit inside us to help us acknowledge that, hey, what these words are saying to us is, is true and alive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So if you're just sitting there, and you get no excitement, when the Word of God is coming to you, well, either you're not paying attention or you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're just a natural man and you can't get excited over it. So then we've got to question ourselves. Why doesn't the Word of God excite me? Am I really truly born again? Or am I just playing the role? The Word of God is alive. It's alive. And it will excite you. There's a lot of scriptures that are full of power. And if you don't get an excitement over it, then like I said, either you're a natural man and you don't have the Holy Spirit or you're just not paying attention. When we go to church, or when we listen to a teacher or a, pre uh, a, te a teacher or a preacher, then we need to listen. We get we have to give our full attention to what he's saying, because the words he is speaking, if he's a man of God, is the words of God. We don't just make it a regular traditional routine to go to church and just sit there. Okay, well, hurry up because at twelve o'clock I'm ready to go. Now, we're there to hear the Word of God. And if you're excited and you receive the Word of God and it makes you excited, huh, time will fly. It'll be 12 o'clock and before you know it, hey, you want more. Time won't mean anything when you're in, into it, when you're receiving the Word of God. There's places in the Bible where they preached all night. Why? Because people were listening. They were receiving the word. But when you go to church for other than that, just for show, then you're going to be looking at your watch and saying, okay, it's almost 12. Let's end this thing. The word of God is quick. It's alive. It's It's real. We have to learn that the Word of God is real. It's alive. It also says that the Word is powerful. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, he says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? He said, my word is like that. My word is like fire. It's like a hammer. Fire. Like as a fire, God's word is, is a great purifier which destroys all that is false. That's what God's word will do. Like a hammer, crushing within the heart everything that is evil like a hammer a sledgehammer sometimes it has to be that heavy because sometimes our heart gets hard and sometimes he needs to use a sledgehammer but his word is like a fire and like a hammer that's how powerful it is it penetrates the heart it purifies the heart that's how powerful His Word is. In Matthew 10, verse 1, And when He had called unto His twelve disciples, He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. His words are powerful enough to go against unclean spirits. His word is powerful enough to heal the sick. 
See, the Lord has the gift of healing, which means He will tell someone, He will give someone the word, go lay your hands on this person because I'm going to heal them. And it's not this person that's doing it, but it's the words that God is using through this person to heal that person. God's words can heal, can heal, can heal the brokenhearted. If you're down in the press and there's no way you can see light and you think there's no hope, God's words is powerful enough to reach down deep inside of you and take you out of that depression. In Acts 19.15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Now the demons are saying that because they had, they had people back then who wanted to imitate you know, the power of Jesus. They didn't have the power of Jesus. But they heard about it and they wanted to see if they could do it. But the demons know. The demons know the Word of God and they know the Word that's coming just from man. And they said, here, who are you? You're trying to cast us out? Who are you? The demons know the Word and how powerful it is. They know that the Word is powerful enough to cast them away. Mark 3.15 And to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. Again, God can heal the sick and God can cast out devils. You know, we, many, of, many of us have seen The Exorcist, the movie. God does not have to go through all this ritual routine with holy water and blah, blah, and doing what they did on that show. If you're a man of God, all you got to do is through the power of God, of the Holy Spirit, is rebuke the devil from the person in the name of Jesus. You don't do it. The power of God does it. And that's it. All it takes is a word from God to cast out demons. You don't have to go through no ritual. You don't have to go collect holy water. You know, some people believe that. But right here, it, all it takes is the Word of God to cast out demons. It has the power of destroying the hopes of sinners, cutting them down under conviction and prostrating them as if a sword had pierced their heart. That's the power of the Word of God. It can penetrate the heart. It can do that. It can convict. And it does. And many times we run away from that conviction. It has the power to raise the dead. Did you hear what I said? It has the power to raise the dead. Do we all know about Lazarus? It was God's words that brought Lazarus back from the dead. All Jesus had to do was speak it. Did you hear me? All he had to do was speak it. It has the power to raise the dead. It has the power for the deaf to hear. It has the power for the blind to see. It has the power for the dumb to speak. And it has the power to make the lame walk. And it also has the power to put down Satan's kingdom. And that time is coming. But the Word of God is powerful. We're not just talking about some words. Like I said, 
We're not just talking about some words that we just speak with our mouths. We're talking about some power behind the words that we speak through the Holy Spirit. We have power with the Holy Spirit. We have to recognize that when we are born again Christians, we have power in us. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And all we have to do is speak the words. But if you don't know the words, do you have the power? No. You got to know the words to have the power. So, if you're just a Christian who likes just to listen, but you don't read the words yourself, yeah, sometimes you might remember what the preacher says. But he didn't tell us to only listen to preachers and not, not read the words ourselves. Everyone should read the words of God. That is our food. That's the preacher's food. That's the elder's food. And that's the born-again Christian's food. Is the Word. And we need this food. And when we're walking in the Spirit, you'll be amazed what kind of power you have behind you. you got to be in God's will. Because He knows if you're trying to misuse this power. Because if you're trying to do that, He's not there. It's when you're in God's will, walking in His will, walking in His Word, that you have this power. It says it's a two-edged sword. One edge convicting and converting believers. That's what one edge can do. The other for condemning and destroying unbelievers. So it's a two-edged sword. And it cuts both ways. The Word of God penetrates deep into a man's heart. There's no other sword can, can do that. You can go to a psychiatrist and let him speak to you, or, or really, he listens to you. But when he does say something, his words are not going to penetrate your heart. Well, this is what you need to do. No, God's words can. God's word is strong. It's strong. And it's a two edged sword. It convicts us, the believers, and it destroys the unbelievers. It enters, it enters into a, a man's soul and spirit, into all, into all of our passions, to our very thoughts, even our secret intentions, the emotions of our hearts. That's, it, it, it enters into all that. Well, other people or other things, or whatever it may be, can't do that. Only God's words can do that. Enter into our heart. Also, the two-edged sword. It also means there's two ways of you, can, you taking the Word of God. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 through 32, it, it's, it, Jesus was speaking to him. And to some of the people, it filled them with, with wrath. It angered them. It angered them so bad they wanted to kill him. And then there's other ways that you take the words of God and you can be astonished by it. So those are two ways you can take the word of God. Not only does it penetrate you two different ways, but you also accept it two different ways. <coughs> the Word of God is quick, powerful. <clears throat> it's a two-edged sword. It's also a sunder of soul and spirit, which means it makes a soul that has been a proud spirit to be humble, and then it takes the spirit to be meek and obedient. Because we all have that soul and spirit. We all have a spirit without the Holy Spirit. We all have a spirit. And what the Word of God does, it takes that spirit and makes it obedient to the Word of God. And it takes your soul and makes it humble. 
And that's what it says here, asunder of soul and spirit. Only God's Word can control, have power over your soul and your spirit. I can't think of any philo ph philosophies of men that can penetrate your soul and your spirit. They can work on your mind, which most of the time that's what they do, but they cannot penetrate your soul and your spirit. They cannot go into the heart. They can only mess with your mind. God's words go to the soul, to the spirit, to the heart. It's all, it also talks about the joints and marrow. Proverbs 3, verse 8. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Meaning it is good for you. Word of God is good for you. Marrow in the bones, you got your outside layer of bones, which, which is hard, and then right in the middle of your bone, you got the marrow, which is soft. Right here, that's the way God's words are. They're hard and they're soft. They're health to your bones. Christ knows what, it's, what is in a man. So His word reaches even the, the intimate knowledge of a man's hidden feelings and thoughts. Distinguishing what is spiritual from from what is Him. What God's Word can do, I don't think we've ever really understood or comprehended it. It symbolizes the power of the Bible to penetrate to the inner depths of a person's thoughts and motives. You can't hide anything from the Lord. But this is all what the Word can do. The Word is powerful. It's quick. And it does all these things. It works on your soul, on your spirit, even down to the joints and the bone, the marrow. It's also intent of the heart. It is to show that we cannot escape the notice of God. That all insincerity, unbelief, hypocrisy will be detected by him he can see these things and that since our hearts are perfectly open for him we should be sincere we should be we should know this if we didn't know it we know it now we cannot hide Nothing from God. Our hearts are totally open to Him. We can't fool Him. So we might as well go ahead and be serious about our walk with the Lord. We might fool people, but we can't fool the Lord. And who is more important? So if you can't fool the Lord, why in the heck are you trying to fool someone who can't do nothing to you anyway? We should, share, we should fear Him who can destroy body and soul. So since we know that we cannot hide anything from the Lord, you better, we better get serious with our walk with Him. Because like I say again, some of us is playing a game. Some of us act like we're Christians when we're around Christians, but then we act just like the lost when we're with the lost. God can see that. You're not fooling anybody. I mean, you can fool people, but you can't fool God. The world will turn the inside of a sinner out. And let him see what is in his heart. That's what the Word can do. It can take what's inside of you and show it to you. Show it to you. 
God will show you where your heart is. And there's times we don't like it. Like they did in, in the book of Luke. They got angry about it. When God shows you where you're really at, sometimes we have a hard time receiving that. But that's what He does. Intent of the heart. He will show us what's our intentions. Why we do things. Is it to glorify Him or is it to glorify ourselves? He will show us what our intent is. He will take the inside of us out and show it to us. That's how powerful and quick the Word is. It's alive, it's real, it's powerful. It does all these things. It, it takes your heart and just totally exposes it to you. He already knows it, and pretty much you already know it, but there's some things He might have to show you, and He does. And we as Christians, born-again believers, we need to be ready to accept it when He shows us what our intent was. Ready to repent if our intent was wrong and make it right. His words are alive. His words are very alive and they're quick. They're powerful. You know, sometimes we sit in church and the preacher, he may say something like this, like in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When he says, and the life, what does that mean? He is the life. When we give our life to Him, then we have life. Do you know that we're all dead until we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior? We're dead. And Jesus says, I am the life. We come to Him. He gives us that life. Now, we have preachers who say that. I'm like, I get all excited when I hear something like that. But then, there's people who act like there was nothing, that nothing has been said. You have life. Did you hear what I said? You have life. You are no longer dead. When you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you are no longer dead. Now to me, that's better than any Dallas Cowboy touchdown which when they make touchdowns I get all excited now what should I get more excited over Cowboys making a touchdown or knowing that I have life now that the Lord has brought me from death to life John 8 32 and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free again did you hear what I said Free. We're no longer under bondage. We're free. When you belong to God, you are free. The devil no longer has any kind of hold on you. You are free from that. Are we getting excited yet? Do we have a smile on our face? Is anybody out there saying, Amen? Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Let me give you another one. John eleven twenty six, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Hold me back. Hold me back. They shall never die. We shall never die. If we believe in Him, we will never die. Amen? Praise God? I know somebody out there saying it. Whoever's listening to this tape, I'm sure they are. 
We shall never die. Praise God. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. This is the Lord speaking. The Lord himself, God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, says, I have made you for my glory. Just, you know, us. He has made us for His glory. Oh. Why would God want to make someone like me for His glory? I don't understand, but His Word says it. He has made us for His glory. That's good news. All the, That's what gospel means. Good news. This is, a, this is good news here. And the Bible is full of good news. First John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What did I just say here? You can know. It says know here. We can know it. We can know it. Not hope that, oh, I hope this is true, you know. No, no. God says right here, and I believe all the scriptures are inspired by God. I take every scripture of God as being true. And when he says right here, I can know. Praise God, I can know. I have no doubt. He didn't say maybe right here. He says you can know. That's something to get excited over. And we can know this. Not just hope for it, but know it. It's okay to get excited. When, well, like I said before, don't quench the Spirit. Not only in words, if you want to say, Amen, praise the Lord, if you want to lift your hands to Him. That's biblical. If there's any Baptists out, here, out there listening to this, you can lift your hands to the Lord. 1 Timothy 2.8 I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands. Lifting up holy hands. If you're in a church that doesn't lift you, let you lift your hands, if they tell you uh, you can't lift your hands, they're telling you that you got to quench the Spirit, uh, I'd find another church. Because it is a sin to quench the Spirit. Right here it is biblical to lift your hands to the Lord. That's praising Him. And when they don't allow you to praise God, then you need to go somewhere else. Psalms 134, verse 1 and 2. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Lift up your hands. We can lift our hands to the Lord. Let no man tell you you can't lift your hands to the Lord. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you you can't lift your hands to the Lord. Hey, the servants of the devil do it all the time. You go to these rock concerts. They got their hands all lifted up. Not only rock concerts, you, you can go to these uh, country concerts. They lift their hands up. They, they're lifting their hands up because they enjoy whatever entertainment they're getting. Well, I enjoy the, the entertainment of the Lord. And when I enjoy the entertainment of the Lord, I'm going to lift my hands up to Him. Just like... Born again believer, I'm going to lift my hands to the Lord. I'm going to praise Him because He is worthy and it is biblical. And because the Word of God is quick, it's alive, it's quick, it's powerful, 
And because of that, it brings me alive. And the Holy Spirit that is inside of me, I quench it not. If the Holy Spirit on me wants to praise God, I let it. If the Holy Spirit inside of me wants to lift my hands to the Lord, I let it. I am not ashamed. And when it's biblical, when I have scriptures that say, hey, God says this is okay, I'm doing it. If John Doe next to me doesn't like it, he doesn't have to be next to me. I'm shown here in Hebrews 4.12 that the Word of God is for real. I've shown what all it can do, what the power it has to do. But mainly, I'm shown that it's real. It's not just some letters in a book. It's not just some words we might speak. Just like for reading the book. These, this book is alive. So when we read the Word of God, we need to remember that. We need to remember that these words that, we're, that we are reading in God's Bible, that they're alive, they're real, and we need to believe them. And we also need to be obedient to them. Praise God. Praise God that we are going to heaven to be with Him. If you're a born-again believer... We are going to heaven. We are no longer dead. We are alive. We have salvation. Think about that. We have salvation. The devil cannot touch us. Yes, the devil has power over people. But people who do not have the Holy Spirit that live in them. If you're a born again believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And there's no way that the devil or his demons can live in the same place where the Holy Spirit is. So when you're a born-again believer, be happy, man. Be happy. Be full of joy. Be full of happiness. Because the devil cannot touch you. The only power he has over you is what you let him have. You let him have. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for being so real to us, Father. We thank you for the power, for the power of the Holy Spirit that you have let live inside of us. Father God, help us. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to walk in the footsteps that you have set before us. Because we know as long as we're in your will, Father God, we're under your protection. You're our Father and you watch over us. We have nothing to fear because you are our Lord. We believe in you. We accept you. We need you. Thank you, Father, for these words. Thank you, Father, Thank you that there is a life in the words that we read. We love you, Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for showing us these scriptures. I pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.